out as far as announcements, but hey, that's what the that's what the monitor's for. Can you say amen? We, last week we were talking about how in Galatians 3, 13, Christ hath, past tense, he's already did it. Already did it. Not waiting for him to do it. Not hoping he's going to do it. But Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth upon a tree. Why? Why did he do that? So the blessings of Abraham might come up on the Gentiles. Well, what was the curse? Uh, death, physical death, spiritual death, sickness, and poverty or lack. And so that's why when we read in 3 John 2, he said, Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper, be in health even as thy soul prospers. Now, if you don't believe in healing, you don't believe in prosperity, well... You're only going to get what you believe God for. Can you say amen? It's good every once in a while just take your Bible, and I do it. I do it quite a bit. Sometimes I do it with the congregation. But I just take my Bible and I say, this is the Word of God. I am what it says I am. Well, then i got to find out what I am, what it says I am. Then I say I can have what it says I can have. Then i got to find out what, I can, what it says I can have. Every promise in this book is yes and amen. No promise in here is God. If God made the promise, it applies and qualifies to you. Amen? But many times we disqualify ourselves uh, from, the, from what God wants us to do. Well, there's several ways we can do that. One is unbelief and one is being disobedient. Can you say amen? But... I know as believers and as those that love God, we want to be obedient. Amen. We, we want to be obedient. Now, once again, you take people that don't believe they can live a life without sin. Well, they're going to sin. They're going to get up every day and have a conscience that they're going to sin at some point. It's not if it happens, it's when is it going to happen. But, when, but we should get up with the mindset that, bless God, sin has no dominion over me. It has no dominion. Now, temptation is going to come. It's going to come to all of us. Can you say amen? But when you yield to that temptation, temptation is not sin. I don't know why I'm going here, but let's just go with it. Temptation is not sin. If temptation was sin, then we're all in trouble because Jesus was tempted. And if, if temptation is sin, then that would qualify Jesus as a sinner. And if Jesus was a sinner, we're all doomed and on our way to hell. Can you say amen? But bless God, he didn't sin, and, and he, he, was, he defeated sin, and he became sin for you and I. So you got to know what you believe, and you got to believe in better line up this book. I never get amazed of all the crazy things that people believe that's unscriptural. Amen. Have you ever run into anybody like that? Well, I've met way, a lot of them, way too many, just to tell you the truth. And many of them sit in churches for years, and they've never read the Word of God for themselves. They just take, uh, they get their theology from, well, I don't know, from wherever. Uh, History Channel, probably the worst place to get your theology from. And a lot of people do. They get their theology from Grandma and Grandpa that got their theology from old wives' tales and fables and all this. And, but bless God, we can go to the Word of God and know the truth. Can you say Amen. And if you know the truth, you'll never fall for a lie. And so we should, you should be a constant studier, constant uh, in this book to find out what it says. So in Isaiah, if, you, if you're taking notes, write down Isaiah 1 and 19. And how we can move away from the curse and into the blessing. Isaiah 1 and 19 says, if you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. Now, God wants us to have good, but he wants us to be willing and obedient first. And Moses was an example of that principle. We read in Hebrews 11, many refer to Hebrews 11 as the, uh, the hall of fame or the hall of faith. 
and that's good. That shows what men and women were able to do by faith. Amen. You'll never go wrong by walking in faith. Now Hebrews 11, 24, 25, and 26 talks about Moses. Moses has talked quite a bit in Hebrews 11, but it says by faith. How did he do it? By faith. He didn't do it by his feelings. He did it by faith. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ. Wait a minute. Christ? Well, that's just what it said. Esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had respect unto the re recompense of the reward. Moses, I mean, you talking about a man having it made. He was it. He was Pharaoh's daughter. I mean, come on. Therefore, he was the king's grandson. And if you got grandkids, you know what that means. They really spoil. Amen. It's the truth. And but Moses, I tell you, when you're a child of God, you you I'm telling you, if God, if you're really a child of God, like Moses was, but we're different than Moses was. Moses was a child of God through lineage, through birth. But bless God, we're the children of God through the new birth. Come on now, help me. And if I tell you, a, a person that's a child of God through the new birth, you, you might, have, you might have, see everything I have in the world you think you want, and you get it, but I'm telling you, the, you'll esteem the reproach of Christ. You'd rather, have, you'd rather suffer persecution for Christ than have the things of the world. And you know this whole thing, listen, I believe in the prosperity, but I believe that God's people, the Bible says all that live godly will suffer persecution. So the people think you're going to get through here without no tribulation, without persecution, need to read the Bible. Can you say amen? And so therefore Moses give up everything, probably next in line to be Pharaoh. He give it up to rather to be with the people of Christ and suffer the reproach. What did he refuse? Everything, basically. I mean, Egypt was the center of the, of the world at that time. I mean, it, it would be, it was no other place like Egypt. Um, I mean, he probably wore gold like you and I, I mean, un, uh, like untold what he, there's no telling what he had. People to feeding, people to bathing, people to do everything for him. He had prestige, he had honor, and had multiplied well. He had all the things that this world will offer us. Yet Moses gave them up to ex be esteemed or the reproach of Christ was greater than his riches. All the treasures in Egypt. Moses saw a difference between God's people and the people of the world. That's why you see people most, many times I, I just, I just want to, I want to tell you something. I've seen something on Facebook, and, and I know some of you think, well, he's a hypocrite. He shouldn't have watched that. But I had a reason. I did have a reason for watching it. There was a video that came through, and it was of a very well-known band. And if I mentioned their name, most of you know who they are. And I just want, I wanted to watch it because I wanted to see, and and I and I, I saw what I was looking for. I saw where this man, the guitar player, was. Uh, I would say probably demon possessed. If definitely not, he was demon oppressed. And just like a puppet on the string, uh, his facial expressions and everything uh, was just, and, and had everything that man, no, no fame and fortune, but I guarantee he's miserable. And we can go through countless people with wealth. I mean, we can look at uh, Whitney Houston and Elvis Presley and Kurt Cobain. I mean, everybody. I mean, you know, Kurt Cobain was, I mean, he was known as changing a whole genre of music, but yet killed himself. Had everything going for him. 
You can have money, and God's not opposed to God's people having money. What he is opposed is money having you. Amen? And when it becomes your God, Jesus said you can't serve manna and him because if you love, you'll love one and hate the other. So and too many people are uh, more interested in making a dollar than they are serving God. Can you say amen? There's, and, and, you know, Jesus said, do what? Seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. But there's people that would rather pursue the dollar than pursue God. Amen? Now listen, men, it, it's biblical for you to work. If a man don't work, he ought not eat. It also says that a man that don't provide for his family, his own household, he is worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. And so even though it's scriptural to work, it's scriptural to make income, and if God is not opposed to you having wealth, but he's opposed to wealth having you. And here Moses give all of it up to be with God's people. I, I mean, we've all heard the stories of people giving up wealth uh, to serve God. Matter of fact, that you, many of you probably see posts or you've heard of the Vineyard Church in Chattanooga. There you go. You want to go someplace in your Chattanooga, go to the Vineyard. Go to the Vineyard. There, they started out, the, a man, uh, he sold, I forget what he sold, he sold a piece of property. He took every bit of it and sold into that ministry. I've heard of uh, ministries taking every penny they had, mortgaging their house, selling their home, and begin to pour into ministry because they believed God that he would re replace. And Jesus made that very clear. For everyone that gives up houses or lands or mother or father or brother or sister for my name's sake shall inherit a hundredfold in this life and in the life to come. Can you say amen? amen. And so, uh, but yet we, but on the same token, Christian people, are some of the most stiff, close-handed with their money I've ever seen. If you don't believe me, go to ask your local restaurant waiters about those that come in to, uh, uh, to eat on Sunday after their meal. They say that's, most of them don't even work on Sundays. They say because they can't make no money. They, they, they call them the church crowd, which would probably be the best title for them because I'd say many of them ain't Christians. I'd say they got it right and well, we got it wrong. But they say the church crowd, for the biggest part, well, I'm just telling you what they say to me. If they'll say that to me, knowing I'm a Christian, knowing I'm a pastor, think what they say about us when we're not around. Say that so most of them are the most hateful, most demanding, and the weakest tippers we have all week. That's why they like to work when they have happy air, when the drunks are there. Because the drunks, they'll, they'll just give it away. They don't care. Amen? But yet, we, we hang on to it. Now listen, you've got to use wisdom. But my God, bless it. Remember what I said earlier? We should do everything as we're doing it unto Christ. If you go in there and you're a Christian, and they know you're a Christian, show them the love of God. Can you say amen? amen. Now I understand if a waiter does a poor job and don't do what they're supposed to do, well, I still say tip them, but you don't have to maybe... You know, let your tip be a reflection of, of or maybe they could do better. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, if I don't do a good job, I ain't going to get paid like I should either. But at the same time, we shouldn't be closed-fisted. And, 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 and people, are, you know, they, 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 they don't want to give. They won't give. And yet God will still bless any ministry. I, I, I'm very, you know, any ministry that's really doing the work of God, I've never seen them any of them have to close because of money. Can you say amen? God has a way of getting it into your hands. So Moses gave it all up. Now, so, one of the, so for Moses, he qualified for prospering. Is he esteem? You've got to learn to esteem earthly things lower or less than heavenly things. You can't put earthly treasures above heavenly treasures. You can't do it. Everything in this building... You, it's a sobering thought, and I don't mean to be, you know, 
you know, bloom despair and agony on me. But you got to understand something. One day everything you own, somebody else is going to own it. You say, well, I'm going to leave it to my kids. Well, you might, but still one day somebody else is going to own it. And probably it won't have nothing to do with your family at all. Well, I'm saving this from, bless God, these family heirlooms. Oh, hallelujah. Well, bless your heart. Because I can say one day somebody else is going to own it. Amen? Amen. Now, there's nothing wrong. The Bible says a good father leaves an inheritance to his children's children. Amen? That's, that's what the Bible says. But what's considered a good inheritance? Well, a lot of people would think a lot of wealth. Well, that's, that probably is part of it. But a legacy, a Christian heritage, a, a Christian inheritance, can you say amen? That's, that's what will last. And that will go on from your children to their children and on to their children. Can you say amen? I think about a brother. I don't care to mention his name. Brother Philip. And I see him. I see how God has blessed him. That man is, I mean, you look at that family, that's a huge family. And, and at least everyone I know, they're serving God. He's got kids in the ministry. He's got grandkids in the ministry. He's got uh, great-grandkids. And bless God, I think now he's even got great-grandkids. I mean, you, you think about that, how that just keeps moving. It'll be a heritage from now on. Amen. That is a, a good inheritance. And so many times we put earthly things above heavenly things. We cling on to them. I've seen so many families get into it over stuff that some of it should have been took to the dump. Let's just be real. Some of it wouldn't work. I mean, I wouldn't even load it on my truck. But yet they fight and squawk and carry on and and. Remember this, one day somebody else is going to own it. Somebody else will own it. Now, once again, it's not wrong to have money because if you go to Sonic tonight to get a milkshake, even though they're half price after 8 o'clock, you still going to have to have money to buy one. I thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> Anybody wants to buy me a milkshake after 8 o'clock, they're half price. But you're still going to have to have money to get one. Or somebody's going to have to have money if, if somebody gets one. So we got a habit. It's part of the, and it's a system that, that we're in. But you can't let your finances consume you. I made a commitment a long time ago, and I've lost work. I've lost, I've lost decent jobs. I, well, it, on the surface, I've turned down work. They said, well, we need you to come uh, on Wednesday afternoon. No, I'm not, and I'm not going to send my employees either. I'm not going to do it. I've had to turn down jobs. Well, you know, commercial places. Well, we're only closed on Sundays. Well, I'm sorry. But here's some people that could do it for you. Not, but not me. Amen? Because I trust God to provide. And God wants you to prosper. Can you say amen? And yes, he wants you to prosper financially. But your prosperity depends on putting the first things first. And so... With God, in Old Testament, God told the, the people of Israel to keep his statutes and walk in his commandments. And we, we looked at that last week from Deuteronomy 28. And so we want to prosper spiritually. And when we put God's word first and practice God's word and walk in that truth, God expects the same of you and I today. Now, I had somebody tell me yesterday, I know what they was getting at. That, you know, we're not under the law. Bless God, we're not. Jesus fulfilled the law. And the Bible, as we looked at last week, if we walk in love, love is the fulfillment of the law. So we are under the law of love. And God expects you and I to walk in love. Can you say amen? Come on now. If you don't walk in love, then you're not walking in, God, walking in the commandment. Jesus, what is the greatest commandment? Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy mind, and all thy strength, and to love thy neighbor as thyself. You would do well to keep those two commandments. Can you say amen? Now, so once again, let's, I quote this all the time. 
I quote it to myself. You need to learn this verse. Very short verse to remember, but it's packed full. It's packed full. Beloved, just say it with me. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as thy soul prospers. You can say it like this, and I do sometimes. I'm, I'm the beloved. And God, you wish above all things that Dwayne prospers, that Dwayne is in health, and that Dwayne will prosper in, my, in his soul. Amen. Put your name in there. It, verse, it applies to you. And then the next, in the next couple of verses goes on to say, listen to this, that God has no greater joy than to hear that his children are walking in the truth. There's only one way you'll prosper in your spirit is when you walk in the truth of God's word. That is, once again, that is why it's important for you to know what's in the word of God. Come on now. So many people believe so much nonsense that, that like yesterday, I was, I, I tried to, I just made it funny. I went to a place to, and used the restroom and I got soap on my hands and the water was turned off. So I came out and I said, you got a sink I can wash my hands in. And they said, yes, back in the back. I said, you know, because what the Bible says, they looked at me real funny. I said, yeah, you know, the Bible says next, godliness is is next to cleanliness, or cleanliness is next to godliness. That's not in the Bible. But a lot of people believe that. You know, I was watching an episode of Duck Dynasty, and old, Miss K quoted that to, to what Willie, or whatever his name was, the old man. He was trying to get a little loving, and he was using the Bible. She was telling him he needed to take a shower. He wanted some sugar. And then she said, and he's, he used the verse that a wife's not to refuse her husband. He's right. And vice versa. But she said, well, the Bible also says cleanliness is next to godliness. No, Miss K, it don't say that. I'm sorry. And uh, so we got to know what it says. There's all kinds of things that people believe is in the Bible that I've yet to find. Now, you know, if somebody wants to show me, I'm all, I'm, I'm a, I want to learn. If it's in there, I want to know it. Can you say Amen. You might have a translation that may be in there. I'm not so worried what's in some of these translations. I'm worried what they've taken out. Amen. You better, you better check your translation. I ain't going to get on that right now, but I'm going to just give you that warning. So he told her to walk in his statutes, walk in his commandments, do what is right in his sight. And he said, I'll take sickness from the midst of you. And I'll number your days and I will fulfill them. When the people of, when the Hebrew people come out of Egypt, the Bible says there was not a sick one among them. Now, I don't know how many people. I've heard every kind of figure from 600,000 to 6 million. I don't know how many come out of Egypt. But I know this. There wasn't a sick one among them. Zero. I'm sorry, Charleston Heston, never who made the Ten Commandments movie, showed them all coming out over a hunchback and just barely could walk. The only problem they had walking was carrying everything they took out of Egypt. Yeah, now they might have had trouble with that because they, they took everything Egypt had when they left. Come on, my God. The Egyptian people was ready to give them everything they had just to get them out of there. Oh, hallelujah. That'll preach right there. Sometimes people will give to you just to, so you leave them alone. Don't, I just, like, like Festus, I'll call for you at a more convenient time. He was, yeah, well, that, that's another message. But they went out of Egypt, and the people of Egypt give them, they had everything. Oh, God, come on now. They, had, they was going on a three-day journey to worship. Well, they got sidetracked. It took them 40 years. But that's another message. My God, come on, Lord, help me. And they were on a three-day journey to worship, got sidetracked. But they left Egypt. They went into Egypt as wealthy people. Remember, Joseph got them down there. 
and they began to prosper, and the, and the Pharaoh died, and the Pharaoh knew not Joseph. And this is where the whole trouble started for the people of Israel. 400 years, they was in hard bondage. They went in prosperous, and Pharaoh stripped them. He come against them because he was afraid of them. You know, the world really is afraid. They're, they're not afraid of church-going folks, but they're afraid of people that's on far for God. I'll tell you that. They, they, don't, they ain't afraid of church folk. But they are afraid of people that don't, won't back down off the name of Jesus. Won't back down off living right. And so they try, that's why they come against us. Yet God, when he delivered, he took everything that had went down with 70, was it 70 or 75 people, went down into Egypt. Bless God, let's just say that it was the 600,000 came out. Wealthy people, they prospered. And there was not a sick one among them. And God is no respecter of persons. Because he said in Galatians 3 that these blessings. See that's what when God told Abraham that he was going to be the father of many nations. And that his seed would be in bondage for 400 years. Abraham knew all about that before he even had a child. Well bless God. Now we read in Galatians 3 last week that the blessings of Abraham would come up on the Gentiles. That's you and I. Third John 2. Let that be your principle for life. Now once again, I know. You, you start talking about prosperity, people are going to label you automatically with some of the nonsense that we do see on TV and there's some on there that my Lord, I think, my God, how in the world can they even use the name of Jesus and, and, and feel good about it with well, some of the stuff they pull. Now listen, I, I, I mean, I, I'm not uh, one of those that say, oh, well, you know, this, this, and this, that they're not of God, but I am telling you this. What are you going to do with all of it? What are you going to do with all of it? Put first things first. Now let's go to Psalm chapter 1. We're talking about the blessings of God. Psalm chapter 1 and verse 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doeth he meditate, Day and night. And then what happens? He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf, shall, his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Whatsoever he doeth. Who, who, who's he? He that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. What was we talking about Sunday? Being under the influence. Much of the world today is under the influence of the ungodly. Amen. Ungodly influence. You will not prosper and you walk in the way of sinners nor sit, sit in the seat of the scornful. But if you delight in the Word of God and you meditate on this book day and night, then you'll prosper. That ain't just something you hope will happen. It will happen. God wants you to prosper. You hear me say this all the time. Well, I'm, I'll get ahead of myself, but this is all right. Let's just go with it. You hear me say all the time, God said, the gold is his and the silver is his. Did he not say it? Did he not say that? He said it was his. Well, he didn't put it here for the devil's crowd. Put it here for you and I. He said the gold is mine and the silver is mine. Well, also the Bible tells us, I believe it's in Romans 8, tells us that we're heirs of God. Well, if, it's, if I'm an heir of God, and I am, not if I am, but I am, 
If I'm an heir of God, and if you're a child of God, you're an heir. If it's his, then guess who else it belongs to? You. Amen. So, now, it's funny. Now, like I say, it's funny. And like I say, I, there's, there is much of the prosperity gospel that you got to have a balance. You never hear them talk about being born again. You don't never talk about people going to hell. All you hear them talk about is finances, finances, finances. Well, we need to talk about finances, but you got to have a balance. It don't get no good to get somebody wealthy, rich here on earth and die and go to hell. Won't do them a bit of good. Won't do a bit of good to get them healed if they die and go to hell. Can you say amen? First things first. Now, many people will come to Christ if they see somebody get healed or they get healed. Jesus used that many times. The apostles in the early church used that many times. But bless God. Be the worst thing that could happen to somebody that get healed and live a long life and still die and go to hell. How sad would that be? So you and I should do a, a, an evaluation of our priorities. We should do an evaluation of our priorities. I can remember a, 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 a man, good-looking kid. Look, he looked like Arthur Fonzarelli or something when he was in his prime. And, and, and I remember a man was witnessing to him. They asked him what his problem was. Why wouldn't he, why, he knew he needed to be saved. He knew he was lost. He knew if he didn't get right with God, he was going to die and go to hell. He knew all that. And the person said, what's, what's, what's keeping you from giving your heart to God? And he reached down in his pocket and pulled out two coins and rubbed them together. Money. Well, the sad reality of that story is soon after that he was abusive to his wife and he went too far one night and she shot and killed him. And you say, well, that you don't know what happened to that man. You know, yes, I do. The Bible makes it clear. Somebody shoots you dead, you don't have time to repent. Amen. And so, you know, well, we don't think anything about a, a you know, you, you say for example, names, I don't, of course, I don't, thank God I don't know none of those names, but you wouldn't think nothing about uh, a nightclub making tons of money off heathens. But yet, you know, if a church is financially prospering and, and people's giving, well, that's awful. They shouldn't, they, they, they're, they're, they're not a God. They're out here. They're, they're you know, they're, they're compromising the truth. Well, ain't no same thing about, you know, uh, and listen, you know, you got to do what's right, you know, but just like you don't think anything about going, watching some heathen uh, rock group or some country singer, you don't. Think nothing to go pay thirty, forty dollars to go see them, but you get on the soapbox. Well, them's Christian people. They shouldn't charge. Shouldn't charge to get in. Well, I don't, they maybe shouldn't charge much. They, they do, but they didn't get here for free. You know what I mean? And uh, you got to have a balance. And so, and then the same thing. You know, if if a person wants to leave their job to get a better job, well, you'd applaud them. But you let a minister leave a church to go to another church that pays more, they'll say, well, he only left there so he can get more money. No, maybe God called him there. And maybe God's wanting to bless him. It's funny how the, and many of the church people believe that uh, church folk ain't supposed to be blessed. Can you say amen? Now, you got to, you got to keep a balance, folks. And begin to train your children in these principles. Amen. Don't don't let them you know let them understand. I forgot who it was or something I read or something I knew, but they they made each year they made them you know when they got something for Christmas. You know they they give a portion up to somebody else. I think that's a good I think that's a good idea. 
Most kids get too much anyway. They don't even know what to play with. Amen. We bless people. But train them in giving. And how do we train them? By setting the right example. Children are usually just products of what they see and hear. You've got to set the right example. You have to be the person of faith to them. To do, and you've got to do what's right, not some of the time, but all the time. And now, well, it's just like, you know, like people when they're sick, they think, well, I wonder why I don't have enough faith to get healed. Here's, here's where the church is today. Most people, they'll make sure they have three meals a day at least, at least three. They make sure their flesh is taken care of. They make sure all their appetites are taken care of. But yet they're okay, they think they're okay spiritually coming in and getting a, a, a cold snack on Sunday mornings. Amen. Amen. Because many times that's what they're getting is just cold snacks and half the time they're not even listening. Amen. You, as a believer, this has to be a, remember, meditate on this book day and night. you got to have faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you want faith for your healing, faith for your finances, faith for your prosperity and your spirit, you got to hear the word of God. Amen. God said that we'd have long life and be satisfied in it. Determine in your heart to put spiritual things first and esteem them over earthly things. And esteem earthly things lightly. Put God first even before your own self. Pick up your cross and do what? Deny yourself. Whosoever shall keep his life shall what? Lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall save it. The things in the kingdom are opposite to what we see in the natural. Me, the last shall be first, and me, the first shall be last. So Isaiah tells us if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat from the good of the land. Are you willing, first of all, to, are you, first of all, willing? Now, a lot of people are willing. Well, let me, let, me, let me back that up. A lot of people are obedient. They do it out of obedience. Well, it's because it's the right thing to do. Or to make the preacher happy. Or to get my family off my back. They'll quit preaching to me every time I see them if I'll just do this, but they're not really willing. See, there's a difference. Many people do stuff out of obligation, but they're really not willing. God won't prosper that. You've got to be willing and obedient. And so, once again, if your thinking's wrong, your believing's going to be wrong, and when your believing's wrong, your confession is wrong. Easy to locate where people are in life is by, by their confession. I said it's easy to locate people's faith or the lack thereof, by their conversation. And you can prosper body, soul, and spirit. And you've got to get all three of them synchronized, your thinking, your believing, and your speaking with the Word of God. You've got to synchronize them. The all three should be in line with the Word of God. Your thinking, your believing, and your speaking. Because a lot of times people think one thing and they speak something else. Or they believe one thing, they say they believe, but they speak something different. God give us His Word to get your thinking straightened out. Amen. Be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove. Prove what? What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? Well, what's His will? This book. That's why you have to have it renewed. Now, let's go back. Let me pick up where I was talking about earlier. In Psalm 50, verse 10, it says, For every beast of the forest is mine. 
and the cattle upon a thousand hills. Verse 12 says, If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine and the fullness thereof. Think about that. Every beast of the field and every mountain belongs to God. People, that old song. My daddy sold one of his. My daddy sold one of his cattle today. Well, bless God. Can you say Amen? Once again, you have those people on the on the persuasion that we're just supposed to be poor equals being humble. The more poor you are, the more humble you are. Well, I don't know about that. I know a lot of poor people do a lot of desperate things, which don't seem very humbling. A lot of poor people do a lot of sinful things to stay, stay afloat. Amen? And that kind of thinking and teaching has got a lot of people in trouble. The scripture says, I think it's in 1 Peter, him that steals, let him steal no more, but let him work with his hands. It's amazing how, I mean, you wouldn't think that the Bible would have to address those kind of topics to the church, but apparently he did. Now, we got to go all the way back to the beginning. In the beginning, I mean Genesis. God, in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. We know that. And then in verse 26 of Genesis 1, And God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him have dominion. Over every fish of the sea, the fowls of the air, and everything that creepeth on the earth. He created male and female. And you've heard me teach this many times. How Adam sold you and I. Adam was the little G, the a little G God of this earth. He he had dominion. He had complete dominion over everything. Matter of fact, he didn't God didn't even name the animals. Adam named the animals. Well, did he? What the Bible says, God brought them to Adam to see what he'd call them. And whatever Adam called them, that's what, they were, that's what we call them today. Adam had dominion. You're talking about living on Easy Street. He didn't have to plant no garden. God planted the garden. God put everything Adam and Eve was going to need in the garden before he put Adam and Eve in the garden. That's, and God has everything you and I need. I saw this the other day. I like this. Think about this. Us short people can relate to Zacchaeus. You know a little song, We little man was he, climbed up a sycamore tree, whatever, I don't know. But anyway, my point being, before Zacchaeus needed a tree to climb up to see Jesus, God already had the tree there. Amen. Somebody planted a seed for the tree. Yeah, and God put everything Adam and Eve was going to need in the garden before he placed Adam and Eve in the garden. One simple commandment, all they had. Adam, it's all yours, but you got one thing, don't do it. Don't eat of this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, we know the story. They did. And therefore, he lost that dominion. It was transferred over to Satan. But bless be God, somebody ought to shout because his lease is about to run out on this thing. Amen. But I can go ahead and rejoice today because he don't got no dominion over me. I'm in this world. Jesus decided to leave you and I in this world, but he made it clear we are of another kingdom. Amen. Bless God. And so now, and if people say, uh, Adam lost it all. Because when Jesus was tempted, one of the three temptations of Jesus 
was Satan took him on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the earth, and said these words, I will give you the king, all these kingdoms and the glory of these kingdoms if you will worship me. Well, some people say, well, they wasn't his to give. Well, it's funny, God didn't say it. Jesus didn't tell him that. Jesus said, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him shalt thou serve. He didn't stand there and argue with Satan because there was nothing to argue about. He did have a title. He did have authority. He had the right to give them to him because they were his. Because Adam lost them to... But when, but, but when, but when Jesus come out of that grave and he had a meeting with his disciples, he said, boys... He said, go on all the earth, make disciples, teaching them all things, teaching them to observe all things, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And before he told them that, he said, all authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth, in heaven and in earth. Well, bless God, we're on earth. And therefore, if we're once again, let's go back. Romans 8 said we're heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus. If Jesus has got all authority in the heaven and earth, guess who's got some too? The church. We got joint heirs. That means we're equal. Amen. We're connected. Hip bone connected to the, you know, we're connected. So therefore, if Jesus has got all authority then the church has got all authority. we got dominion. Amen? I said we've got dominion. we got dominion over what? Everything, that all the curse. We've got dominion over sin. I get so sick and tired of hearing people say they can't help but sin. Well, the devil made me do it. No, the devil tempted you, but you did it. You're guilty. But bless God, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you to cleanse you. I like that. I like to be cleansed. Glory to God. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We got dominion. Sin has no dominion. We got dominion over it. We got dominion over sickness. We got dominion over lack, uh, lack and poverty. Now, so let's back up a minute. Now, what's this prosperity mean? mean to be rich. It means to have a full supply. Amen. You know, I, I don't know. I can't prove I'm right and I can't prove they're wrong. But I've heard people talk about it when Elijah went to the widow woman or she was going to uh, make a, two cakes and eat them and die, her and her son. Uh, and, and when Elijah the prophet said, go make one for yourself, make me one first. Uh-oh. Make it for who first? Make it for the man of God first. Now, don't take that wrong. I'm just telling you what the Bible Make it for the prophet first. And she did. And, and I'm, I've heard preachers say that every time she went into that, that, that scoop just scraped the bottom. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I believe when she opened the lid, it was full every time. Amen. But my point being, either, either way, whether it was scraping the, the bottom of the barrel every time she went in there, or when it was, she opened up the lid, it was running out the top. I believe that because well, that goes more to what Jesus said. Show men giving your bosom, shaking down, pressed together, and running over. And either way, God supplied for her being willing and obedient. Because when you're going to eat and die, you're pretty willing to do anything. And she was willing to do it, and she was obedient. See, that's why sometimes we get in desperate situations. Desperate people are willing to be obedient to the Word of God. And But many times we get lax because of the blessings of God, and, and we get lax, and then we wonder why things go haywire, why things go south. Amen. We need to learn to walk in the prosperity that God provides, but we also need to learn to continue to seek Him first. One of the greatest warnings I ever got from a minister was from Brother Roger Scott. I'll never forget it. It's probably been 25 years ago, maybe, yeah, maybe 30, probably closer to 30. He spoke these words. He said, Dwayne, I'm going to be, give you a warning right now. When you begin to walk in the call of God that God has put on you, he said, you'll get lazy if you ain't careful. He said, you'll think you don't got to study no more. You'll get to where you think you don't got to pray as much. 
Because you'll show up. God will show up. He said, remember that. And I have never forgot it. I've never forgot that. Amen. Don't you forget it. Don't, don't get to the place that you think you don't got to st study the word, that you don't got to pray no more. Come on. Now, I'm not talking about going to God and begging, but I'm talking about being in communion with God. That's what prayer is, being in communion with God. Amen. Sometimes you go to God and, hey, say, look here. Now, this is what you said, and I'm going to believe you for it. And you said you was a God that wouldn't go back on your promises. You're not a God that can lie. And you said this promise for me. Now, so I'm believing it for me. And then you walk in faith till you get it. Same way with your finances. If you're struggling in your finances, first of all, are you willing and obedient? Are you being, are you being obedient to God's will for your life? Well, I've been there where I wasn't. I've been where I've been obedient, but I really wasn't willing. I did it because somebody twisted my arm or talked me into it or made me feel guilty for not doing it. Straighten your halos up. You've been there too. But when I got willing on my own accord and got obedient on my own accord, things began to change. And so... Now we looked at Luke... 6 and 38 last week. Luke 6 and 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure pressed down and shaken together. And running over shall men give into your bosom. I've heard these stories and I, I, just, I have a hard time grasping them. We had a man here one time before. And you know I, I, he's a good brother. i and, you know, everything he said was scriptural. But he said some things that I just can't get my, I just, I just, that, did, that didn't line up with scripture, too. He was talking about how God was blessed him one day and money just started falling from the roof of his car. Wait a minute. Well, that's, you must have a sunroof and somebody's riding on top, handing it in, because men should give in your bosom. Amen? I have a hard time believing those things. Amen? You say, well, Jesus sent Peter down and they found a coin. Yeah, but that was somebody's money at one point in time. Amen. It was probably laying there on the bottom of the ocean. It was somebody. It was somebody's. So, you know, the, some of these things, you, you, that's why you got to know the Word of God. If not, you're going to be easily deceived and tricked and you'll all believe anything. People get off on these tangents, studying these. Paul gave Timothy a clear warning. Stay away from these old wise tales and fables and genealogies that produce nothing but strife. Stay away from it. Listen. Especially if you're a novice. And, that, and he, gave that, he gave that warning to Timothy about the, the bishop. And, and a, you know, they shouldn't be a novice. At least they get puffed up. Amen? A novice in what? Well, a novice in life experiences. A novice in the Word. Like I say, I, 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 and listen, I, I was, I mean, I didn't know nothing about nothing. But I knew one time they put this young man, just got out of high school, just got married, put him into a, into a church, a, a big church. I thought, well, that, that, that ain't going to work. And it didn't. It didn't work. Now he's teaching. Now he's teaching public high school. Folks, you can't go against the word of God and expect things to work. I don't care how many good ministers you sit under. I don't care how many Sunday school pens you got. Can you say amen to me? You know I'm telling you the truth. Take what God's calling you. Get somebody. Sit under them. Learn. I was talking to a young man Sunday. And like I say, I don't say things just to be saying them. And I told him, I said, look, I'm going to tell you, I said, you, you already know this. I'm going to tell you something, nothing, you, I ain't telling you nothing you don't already know. And I said, every person that's born again has got a call on their life. But there's, but there's callings. And I believe there's a calling on your life. And I said, and that's good. But you need to let somebody help that mature and develop that in your life. And you need to let somebody mentor you. I said, if not... You lot will get out here and get all kinds of in the crazy ideas and crazy teachings and get off in left field somewhere. 
Can you say amen? Now, Colossians 1 and 2, and I'm going to say this verse and I'm going to finish. Colossians 1, verse 12, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet or able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Glory to God. Why? In verse 13, who hath, that's past tense, hath delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. Glory to God. That ought to make an Episcopalian shout. That we have been brought out of darkness. I don't know about nobody else in this room, but I know what it's like to be in darkness. I know what it's like to be in clutched in the forces of darkness and demonic activity. I know what it's like to be clutched in tormenting spirits. I know what it's like to be bound by devils. Come on, my God. When I read that verse, I think, hallelujah. They talk about people got to go through a deliverance. My God, you don't got to go through. You let him deliver you. He said he'll translate you. He did the work. Glory to God. Come on. He, it, wasn't no, it wasn't no slow process. It's an instant work. Just like Enoch walked with God and he was translated. And what's it say? Just so you'll get what he's saying, he was no more. No more what? He was no more around here. He was no more in this kingdom. He was in another kingdom. How did he, he do that? By faith. See, it all goes back to faith. Well, bless God, we want to get people and, and tell them, well, you got to do this step and do this step. And we talked about deliverance ministry, how it went off in left field and got people lost as ball and high weeds. When the Bible here, the Bible says that's what you got to go by. You can't go by the best authors and the best selling authors. And let, you got to go to the Word of God. Can you say amen? And it says, hath delivered, translated us, instantaneous. You don't got to work to be saved. When you get saved, you're saved. Come on. When you get sanctified, it's a process. But sanctification is right there when you get saved. You can get the Holy Ghost. You don't got to work and wait and beg and tarry for the Holy Ghost. You can be baptized in the Holy Ghost once you get saved. Can you say amen? Matter of fact, that would be the best time to get it. Amen. Well, somebody say amen to me. You need the Holy Ghost if you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost. You need it. I'm telling you. You say, well, I don't know about all that tongue stuff. Well, don't know about the tongue stuff, but know about the Holy Ghost. Know that my God, He wants you baptized. He said this promise is for you and for your children. It's a promise. Well, if it's a promise, it's for you. It's part of your inheritance as a child of God. Can you say amen? I want everything that God's got for me. I don't want to be shortchanged. Amen. Well, praise God. Let's stand. And if you need prayer, we're going to pray. We're going to pray anyway. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, we just bless you. We bless you. Bless you. We bless you. Oh, my soul. And all that's within me, we bless the name of Jesus, who forgiveth all our iniquities, who healeth all our disease, who redeems our life from destruction, and crowns us with loving kindness and tender mercy, who satisfies our mouth with good things, so that our youth is renewed like the eagles. Who is slow to wrath and plentiness. Oh, hallelujah. It's plentiness and mercy. Oh, we thank you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. It's because of your compassion that we were not consumed this day. Oh, hallelujah. And we bless you, Father. We say thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless you. Oh, we surrender to your will. We surrender to being obedient. Lord God, to be faithful, to be good and faithful servants, to be obedient and to the end. Lord, that we not be slothful and disobedient children, but God be children that's pleasing, children that's obedient in your sight. In the name of Jesus.